Welcome to Homecoming Vespers. Welcome alumni and welcome future alumni. There is something special about the Angwin Sabbath. As a newcomer to Pacific Union College, I have learned to cherish the coming of every Friday night. Peace comes dropping slow, as the poet says, and the whole college community lays aside weekday studies, struggle, distraction. Someone might ring the Healdsburg bell. A little later in the evening, I am always inspired by our student-run worship service, complete with earnest, enthusiastic praise music. Some of our visitors tonight could be tempted to say, I don't get their style. That's okay. I assure you, these are young people who sense the power of God's transforming grace. Our, our elders did not always understand our ways, did they? In fact, I hear that back in the distant past, the Wedgwood Trio, with their unplugged folk music, provoked controversy right here. PUC's matchless natural location enhances the Angwin Sabbath. How many of you, when you think of the day of rest and gladness, remember leisurely walks through a thousand acres of trees, meadows, and wildflowers? Almost no one makes it through all 1,900 acres on a Sabbath. At its best, the Angwin Sabbath has always been a window into eternity, a reminder that men and women are created for communion with God. May you be refreshed as you once again enter the holy serenity and joyful praise that is the heart of the PUC experience. Welcome. Happy Sabbath, PUC! Happy Sabbath! Whether you're a current student here or you were in the past, you are always, you are and always will be PUC. We are so excited to worship with you guys today. So if you can have you please stand if you are able so that we can worship together.
three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. We can call out to the Holy Spirit and be assured that he will come when we are gathered in Jesus' name. He was with us when we felt alone. He is with you now, and he will continue to be. As we sing this next song, um, let us ask the Holy Spirit to fill this room, to be within us, and to rest on us. Sing with me. You can look up the lyrics on your phone. It's called Rest On Us. Rest on us.
happy Sabbath, church. So good to be here with you guys. So this morning, I was reading a devotional, and I, I think it applies to this next song. Our, our last song is called I Surrender All. It's one of my favorites. And today's devotional says, it's Jesus talking to us, and he says, peace is my continual gift to you. It flows abundantly from my throne of grace. Just as the Israelites could not store up manna for the future, but had to gather it daily, so it is with my peace. The day-by-day -day collecting of manna kept my people aware of their dependence on me. Similarly, I give you sufficient peace for the present when you come to me by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. If I gave you permanent peace, independent of my presence, you might fall into the trap of self-sufficiency. May that never be. So as we sing this next song, I invite you to surrender it all with me, to approach his throne with thanksgiving and ask him for his abundant peace. Hi, everybody. 
Um, my name is Ashley. I'm Ashley Castro Rodriguez. I'm the Religious Vice President for Student Association. Um, and I want to invite you guys to bow, our heads with, bow your heads with me for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, our Lord who is in heaven, thank you for bringing us here today. Thank you for everything you've done to us and for giving us the opportunity to come together and worship you together. Thank you for providing us with community that brings us closer to you, God. Thank you for our alumni that are here visiting. Thank you for our current students. And thank you for the students that maybe are coming next year. We give you thanks, God, because you are our one and only God. Um, God, today we come to you. We ask you to forgive us of anything we may have done. Um, we know that you are always taking care of us. Thank you again for everything you do for us, for bringing us here again. In your name we pray, amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning to you, Steve. Evening. <laughs> evening. Evening. Oh, my day went by so fast. Oh, my goodness. It's already nothing. This is the best part of the, of the program, I think, to bring back the past to the present and hope for the future. You get to sing with us the College on the Mountain School song. Oh, I know you can do it. If you want, the words are on the back of your lovely church bulletin, along with the music and with all of Ellie. We are going to sing for you and you the college song. Let's, everyone, and you can stand. stand I know you can. Come on, everyone, stand. Good evening, everyone. That was someone. Good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. My name is Ryan Smith. I'm Gabriel Manzano. And we wanted to share with you our experience that we had last year, our last summer, when several of us took some students to Kenya. And I just wanted to just chat with Gabe about what his experience was like when we took a very long plane ride, I think it was probably 20 hours or so, and we landed in Nairobi, and there we traveled for about 45 minutes to this school called 
Caggiato Rescue School. How many of you ever heard of that? And we partnered with Maranatha, a wonderful um, uh, nonprofit Christian organization that is doing some wonderful things all over the world. And there we were able to serve uh, the students, the kids there at Caggiato. And just before I ask you a couple of questions, Gabe, I wanted to just kind of set the stage for what the mission is for the Caggiato School. There, they actually take in um, girls um, from the Maasai tribe, and the idea is they're preventing them from being um, wedded to wedded as an early age, and some other things that they're doing to protect the young girls from those things, without going into great detail. So I want to ask you a couple of questions, Gabe. Um, when the opportunity came to go to Kenya, what made you decide to go? Um, initially, what really got me excited was a friend um, motivating me to go. But unfortunately, he was not able to make the trip due to other plans that summer. But that really discouraged me from going. And he, something that really sat with me was him telling me, I would die to go on this trip if I really get to do that. And you that have the circumstances and the, 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 the ability to go, why would you pick up such an opportunity? Wow. And him saying that really made me meditate and really reflect on my motive for going. And I decided to just get out of my comfort zone a little bit and go and dedicate my time to this. And I, and I mean to tell you, when we were in Nairobi, he was probably the hardest working person there. I mean, he, wore, he outworked all of us, probably because of his age, I would imagine. Uh, he has way more energy than, than we had. Um, so, so the Bible talks about being, um, it, is, it is better to give than to receive. Um, was that true for you in Kenya, and if so, how? Oh, definitely. I think um, one of the big key motivators for going on mission trips in general is I feel that we all have a deep down sense that we don't have much to offer. But really in going and doing something so simple and so small as labor or simple toil for these people and for their, for their needs really showed me how, much, how something so small can have such a great impact and mean so much to others. Yeah, by, by, the, by the end of the time we were there, um, we realized that we had more money left over than we had spent. And so either you or one of the other students came up with this idea. Oh, there's some pictures there. Um, either you or one of the other students came up with this idea. Why don't we put all of our money together and buy some food, buy some, I think we bought some cake, and we bought personal hygiene items and things of that nature. So that was, that was really wonderful to be able to give in that way. Um, so, you know, you have many interactions with the kids there at Caggiato. What was the most memorable moment um, that you, I know there were a lot, but if you were to just pick one, what was your most memorable moment? Um, no, yeah, uh, it was, there was a lot of memorable moments uh, from playing outside to the songs we were singing indoors. Honestly, I do think that day was the most memorable because it wasn't because they were having, a, they were giving us things like bracelets, um, tokens of appreciation, but Clothing. it wasn't necessarily yeah. that, that made it so memorable. It was the energy and the, I feel the, the love that they had in giving such things and how, like, how excited they were to finally give, be able to give back to us for our work. And it was something so small to like, something so small that we, that felt that we did, but they made it feel like it was such a big impact in the way that they received us. And, yeah. and as you can see, there he is again, uh, Gabe is there. One of the things, it was something about Gabe's infectious spirit that, student, that, that the kids really gravitated toward him. So many of the pictures that you'll see is with him because the kids really loved you. He was out there playing soccer with them and doing all kinds of things with them, and they really appreciated that. Um, even now, I keep up with some of, some of the kids there, and they ask me about you. So um, we appreciate that. So, so why do you think um, mission is so important for a Christian? Um, and why, why do you think engaging in some type of mission activity is important? I think the word Christian in, in and of itself explains who we follow and the example that he plays. And there are many other circumstances in the Bible where he says, I have become a Christian and so you should also be so. And that honestly we should be following that example in any way, shape, or form. Uh, 
something that I cannot deny is that service is something that we do simply globally despite the, honestly, all of us. And the Bible itself and even science itself can explain that doing something selfless is what we're, what can bring us most happiness. And that's honestly just in the way the Bible describes it, the theology describes it, it's what we're meant to do. And I think this is the closest. Amen. Amen. Um, I want to encourage you. Thank you, Gabe, for just taking the time to tell us a little bit about your experience in Kenya. I want to encourage you. I don't think you're ever too old or too young to engage in some type of mission activity. And if you don't want to or you can't, support someone who is. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. I have the honor to introduce our, uh, the speaker for this evening. And they're not only alumni, but I'm proud to say they are pioneers. They're athletic pioneers, and they both play basketball. So with that in mind, at 5'4", from Mesa Grande Academy in Cali Mesa, Carla Bartlett. At 6'3", Daniel Monier from Bakersfield Adventist Academy. Carla not only loved basketball, but she also excelled in softball and volleyball. While she was here four years, she set records in points, assists, and steals. She also graduated from FUC for exercise science at pre and pre-physical therapy. Daniel Monier, I admired him just because he threw the ball so far when he played in the murals. It was unbelievable to watch. He also was an RA for Granger Hall. Uh, I will say he was the best quarterback I ever seen go on, come here through PUC. Uh, he graduated from PUC as a business. And uh, Daniel and Carla were definitely very energetic. And one day, I'm sure that... Uh, Carla was working in the gym and saw Daniel shooting some baskets, trying to make some baskets. I'm sure he made one or two. And um, that's where it all started from what I hear. Um, they started text, not, they were, you guys weren't even texting. I think it was Messenger back then, right? Uh, they were doing some sort of communication and they started dating. They're both RAs. And uh, the weirdest, I, I always love to see those couples. They always smile at each other. But when they play, their defense, they were so fiercely. You guys played defense so good. I, had, I always love to see you guys play defense. But I, one of the things that was always confused me that even though they, got, they were dating, they always play on different intramural teams. And I remember that game, right? You know which one I'm talking about. The Frisbee Championship Golf, which the plan was to stop Carla from scoring touchdowns. And I think it didn't go very well, right? She scored six touchdowns that championship game, and they were just amazing to watch. They were an example to watch, uh, and those were one of the couples they admire so much that have gone through PUC. In 2014, Daniel finally got the courage enough to ask Carla to marry him, and uh, they married that year, and they are the definition of teamwork. They are the definition of perseverance. They are the definition of resilience. Please help me by giving up a hand to Dania and Carla Monier. And uh, let's thank Daniel for his contribution to this by pushing me up the ramp. So thank you, Daniel. Um, so my husband, Dale, and I had a great time here at PUC, especially when it came to intramurals. And so... The first thing you need to know about me is that I am a very loyal person. And so when I was here at PUC, I, had, I was here a year before Daniel was, so I already had established teams and connections. And so when I got here, um, when Daniel and I started dating, it was spring quarter, and Daniel took intramurals very seriously. And so this is him. If you know about Daniel, this is his focused face. And so, it was very serious to him that he win his intramural um, games. And so I was already on a team. I was on a team, uh, Michael Jong's team, and this is our star player on our Frisbee team. And I was on his team before I met Daniel. The next year, when it was time for Ultimate Frisbee, Daniel thought that I should be on his team. 
And I was like, well, I already have a team. So maybe you should, you should go find a team if you don't want to be on ours. And so I decided to stay on my old team. And that didn't make Daniel um, very happy. And it so happened that we played against each other in the championship game. And there was a lot of tension and trash talk building up. There was tension between Daniel and I. There was tension between Daniel and Michael. And then there was tension between Michael and everybody else. And our team played great. And I think part of the reason we won that championship is because we had players who played with their eyes open. And so it was easier for them to catch the Frisbee. And that's my husband, Daniel. If you guys don't know, that was him missing. And so we ended up winning. And this is Michael and Daniel. They actually became very good friends after this game. And they ended up um, in each other's weddings. And they're still very close today. But it's funny that the next year, Daniel ended up playing on our team because he wanted to know what it felt like to be a champion. <laughs> so after we won this championship game, Daniel was not happy. And he thought, you know, he was a little dramatic. And he's like, you know, maybe, maybe we shouldn't date anymore. And I was like, he, he got over that very quickly. He realized it was a little bit silly. So he then asked me, hey, do you want to play pickleball together? And I was like, ooh, I don't know. Like, I'm an okay athlete, but racket sports, not good at. And so I was like, you know, I just don't want to let you down. I don't think we should play together. And he's like, no, Carla, don't worry. I got you. Just stay out of my way. <laughs> and so I was like, all right. I took that advice very seriously. I was also a little annoyed by it. And so we made it pretty far. Daniel had a great season that, that season, and we went, made it into the playoffs. So in the playoffs, there was a pivotal game and a pivotal point. And the ball came at me while I was standing in my little corner of the pickleball court, and it came right at me, and it bounced in, and then it bounced out, and I watched it the whole way. And Daniel looked at me, he's like, Carlo, what are you doing? I said, Daniel, you told me to get out of the way. And so we thought it would be a good idea to get married someday. <laughs> Our time here was very meaningful for both Daniel and I, and we have a lot of our closest friends today are people that we met here at PUC. And it's interesting when you're going through college, you're, people tell you that you're supposed to have it all figured out, that you're supposed to know what you want to be for the rest of your life. And for most of us, we're just trying to figure out who we are. You know, a lot of times we're putting on different masks and we're trying to figure out who we are and we're changing the way that we talk based on who we're with and who we want to impress. And so a lot of us don't have it together, and that's okay. But by the time I ended um, my time here at PUC, I kind of figured out what I wanted to do in the direction that I was headed. And so I graduated from PUC. I went to Loma Linda for physical therapy school. I ended up marrying Daniel. We did had to have a lot of talks through the whole just get out of my way thing, and we, we made it work. And then we moved to Orlando where we started our life together. And I was feeling confident in my work as a PT. I was training for an Ironman. And I felt comfortable who I was in my own skin. And that's when it happened. One night, I was driving home from work down a road that we had gone down thousands of times. And one thing to know about this road is that one side of the road is all orange groves. The other side was lots of homes, and they were pretty big lots. So it was a fairly secluded place, and there were no street lights, so it was also dark. And so I was driving down this road, and there was a car that looked like they were coming out of their driveway. And so I came to an almost complete stop, and as the car turned towards me, I started seeing flashes of lights and hearing the popping of a gun. And I heard several bullets hit the front of my car, before I told my friend who I was on the phone with, someone shooting at me. And then the next thing I knew, my phone had flown out of my hand and it was on the dashboard and I could see her name lit up and I could hear her voice saying, Carla, what happened? Are you okay? And then the next thing I remember is looking up 
and looking to the left as I saw the car drive away. And I had blacked out and I don't remember anything for the next six days. So the, phone, the friend that I was on the phone with ended up calling 911 and the paramedics were able to find me by pinging my phone. And when they found me, they said that I was alert and talking. And so when they told Daniel that news, he felt a little bit better and maybe thinking that it wasn't serious. And then on the way to the hospital, um, I had gone, become unconscious. And when I arrived, they took me to immediate surgery. And when the surgeon came out to give Daniel an update about what was happening, he said it looked like a bomb went off inside me because it was one of those bullets that exploded on impact. And so some of the injuries, there was a lot of internal damage and some of the injuries that were there were a liver contusion, fractured ribs and collapsed lung, partial pancreas blowout, left kidney and adrenal blowout, T6 spinal cord injury, spleen blowout, shredded diaphragm, stomach blowout, fractured T10 through 12 vertebrae, and a colon blowout. And during the surgery, I read the surgery report later, and during surgery there was one point where the surgeon just put his hand over the abdominal aorta just to try to stop the blood flow to get some idea of where the bleeding was coming from. And so after they got the bleeding under control, they temporarily closed me up because the plan was to go in over the next few days to do more surgery and more repairs if, that, if I survived that long. And so the next few days were really focused on saving my life and it was really touch and go for about two weeks. But after that, the focus became my legs. And I was told that in the six days that I was intubated, the neuro team came in and they were doing lower extremity testing. And my family said that during this testing, a tear ran down my cheek because I was unable to feel or move my legs. And as a physical therapist, I am aware of these tests, so I think in that moment, I knew what that meant. My mom was sitting with me when I woke up, and apparently the first thing I said to her was, I was shot. And then the next thing I said was, I hope I'm not paralyzed. And I don't remember anything, anyone telling me that I was paralyzed, but I think I just had this innate feeling that I was never gonna walk again. And they were unable to confirm anything by doing an MRI because there were still bullet fragments in my back. And so it was really unsure for the first probably six months to know if there was gonna be any return. But they said that because of just the pure heat and the vibratory impact of the bullet, that that would be enough to cause a spinal cord injury. So the next few weeks were really horrible. I was super sick, but I was also unable to do anything for myself. And I really remember this one day, Daniel was sitting in my room and he was watching football. And I remember laying in my hospital bed thinking, I'm trapped in this body that is broken. And that's when the identity that I had built up for myself over the years completely fell apart. I found my identity in being a PT and I was no longer able to practice in the same way. I found my identity in being an athlete and I was no longer able to compete like before. I found my identity in being a good partner and I wanted to help with household chores and things, but now I was unable to do that. And I found my identity in my independence and I needed help with almost everything. I couldn't swallow food at that point. I couldn't go to the bathroom or shower on my own. I couldn't get out of my wheelchair or get dressed. And I remember working with my OT one day on going to the bathroom. And it took me 10 minutes to get my pants off. And then it took me 20 minutes to try to cath. And then it took me 35 minutes to get my pants back on. And I thought to myself, my entire day is gonna be filled with taking my pants off and putting them back on and doing that over and over and over again. And I thought to myself, how did my life go from helping others improve their quality of life to waiting on others because I wasn't able to shower on my own? 
How did it go from being an athlete and completing a marathon to barely getting out of bed? And after my injury, I really didn't recognize who I saw in the mirror. If I wasn't an athlete or a physical therapist or independent woman, who was I? And I really felt worthless in that moment. And I always, you know, I told myself that I was following God's plan and being a physical therapist. And I think that that is true. But I also think a large portion of that was that I wanted to prove that I was worthwhile. What is the well that you continue coming back to to fill your cup? Is it being a good student, employee, athlete, gamer? Is it being a good friend, daughter, son, roommate? Because there are gonna be days when you do poorly on a test. There are gonna be days maybe when you snap at your friend. And if your identity is tied up in those things alone, you will feel inadequate. There is a story in the Bible about a name, man named Jacob. And when we first meet Jacob, he's a scoundrel. He's cheating and he's devising ways to get ahead. And one of the stories we hear is Jacob is dressing up like his brother Esau. So Jacob and Esau are twins, but Esau is the firstborn, which means he gets the blessing. And so in order for Jacob to get the blessing, he has to steal it. So he dresses up like his brother and he goes into his half-blind father's tent and his dad asks, who's there? And Jacob says, I'm Esau. He doesn't say that he's Jacob. And so he tricks his father and he gets the blessing. And after that, he thinks his brother's gonna kill him, so he runs away. And he does live a good life and God does bless him. But later in the story, he has to confront Esau again. And he's really scared. And so he goes out and he's communing with God. And there's a point where he gets into a physical fight with an angel. And the angel's like, hey, let me go, it's almost daylight. And Jacob says, I'm not gonna let you go until you bless me. And the, Jacob, and the angel asks him, what is your name? And he says, I'm Jacob. And the angel says, you are no longer Jacob, you are now Israel. You are the father of many nations. So Jacob is now Israel, the father of all of God's people. But he can't accept that he, he cannot be Israel until he accepts that he's Jacob. And so when we finally accept who we are now is when we can move past who we are and be who God really wants us to be. Two years ago, I got the news that nobody wants to hear. It's cancer. It was a very rare and treatable form of leukemia but I was honestly sure that they had the wrong person. After all I had been through being shot and paralyzed, I was like, there's no way, right? And so I was in shock, and when the woman who told Daniel and I left the room, Daniel came over to me and he sat on my bed and he whispered, Carla, you're so strong. I know you're gonna get through this. And my response was, I know but I don't wanna to have to be strong anymore. I'm tired. And that diagnosis was really, really hard for me. I was just starting to feel comfortable in my new role, so I changed from physical therapy into pastoral ministry, and I was a youth pastor at Whole Life Church. And once more, something that I cared a lot about was taken away. And while I was in the hospital, I ended up deleting all my social media because it was too difficult to see other people continue to live their lives while I was in the hospital again. And while I was there, I read this devotional about how a pot is made. And the potter breaks down the materials to dust. And that's how I feel sometimes, and I'm sure many of you have felt this as well, that you've just been broken down to dust and you're waiting to see whatever pottery that God is going to make you into. But the best thing about this is that all the ingredients are already present. You embody everything that is true and that is holy and that is good. It's just a matter of surrendering and allowing God to have his way. 
You contain everything that you need. It is all within you. And I'm still a work in progress. I always want to continue to be a work in progress. I don't ever want to be stagnant. And the goal is always to be malleable to situations that you find yourself in. Because you might meet somebody that you don't expect to connect with. And so my very first introduction to Daniel was in the funny book. My tall friend Nessa was always on the lookout for a man. And so weekly, usually on Friday nights, we'd go through the funny book over and over again looking for anybody who was over six foot. And so Daniel was one of those guys who was over six foot. And I was like, hey, Ness, here's one. My second encounter with Daniel was I got a friend request from this old European man. Now, I know he doesn't look that old, but for some reason, I distinctly remember thinking, this guy looks old and he's European. Why is he asking to be my friend? But I saw that there were a lot of mutual friends from PUC, so I added him. And he would be proud to know that he actually is European. He's Swiss. It's a, he wears that very proudly. And the first time I actually met Daniel was in the cafeteria. So him, my twin brother Casey and him were friends. And so I was just passing by. I said hi to Casey. Casey's like, hey, this is my friend Daniel. And I was like, oh, hey. And then we both kind of left without ever thinking anything twice of it. And then the interaction happened where I worked at the fitness center and I was clocking out from work. Daniel was shooting baskets, he was shooting free throws. And you know those, those times where you're like, you see somebody and you know that you have to say hi to them, but you don't really want to like say anything, but you're like, okay, I don't really wanna be rude. Or you're walking, somebody's 30 feet away, so you like have to time when you look up to say hi, you know what I'm saying? And so I was thinking, okay, this is my brother's friend, I don't want to be rude, I'll say something. So I'm walking by and I say, hey, are you going to try out for the basketball team next year? And he's like, yeah, I think I might or something. And I was like, hey, cool, have a good night. And then I didn't think anything of it and I kept walking. And Daniel's like, hey, wait up. I was like, okay. So I stop and I turn. And I never expected what he said next. He said, hey, do you have a off-season workout program that you're, you're doing right now? And my first thought was, you want the girls basketball weightlifting program? And then I looked at him again and I thought, this man doesn't lift weights. And so I was like, sure, I'll give it to you. And I remember on my way up to that, but the second thing I thought after that was, he's one of the good ones. I don't know what it was, but in his eyes, I could tell he was just a very kind person. So I was like, yeah, I'll send it to you when I get back up to my room. And as I'm walking up, I was thinking to myself, sorry, Ness, I think I'm going to go after this one. And we're going to be married 10 years this coming year. But one of the things that this injury has taught me is what it truly means to feel fully seen and fully loved. Our life has changed a lot over the last five, six years. But one thing that really hasn't changed was Daniel's love for me. And Daniel's love for me was so strong after the injury and he treated me so well. And he treated me well throughout our entire relationship. When we were dating, before my injury, and it didn't change after my injury. And Daniel is home to me. And when I thought about coming back to PUC, I really had a lot of mixed feelings. And if I'm being very honest with you, it's not easy to come back here. Because I have so many great memories of what my life was when I was here. All the things that I was able to do that I'm no longer able to do. And I'm really glad that I took the time to do those things, even if it was just standing in the corner of a pickleball court But it is hard to be back here. But one of the things that makes PC meaningful is the people that we've met here. And home is not a place, it's a feeling. And so despite all of that, 
it's good to be home. Thank you. There was a short mission video that we wanted to play just right after I finished. Are we gonna be able to play that now? Yes. Kendra, I graduated from PUC in 1999 with a BS. Hello in from Belize. Uh, we are the Greasert family. My name is Kendra. I graduated from PUC in 1999 with a BS in biology, and I'd like to introduce my family to you. Hello, my name is Kenzie, and this is Elsie. And my name's Emmy. And I'm Nat. Nat, would you tell the audience a little bit about what we do here in Belize? Sure. Uh, we work down here in Belize, Central America, at a missionary training school called MOVE. At MOVE, we primarily have students who are college age and who are interested in serving as missionaries around the world. Uh, it's been really awesome being here for the last three years when we were invited to join the staff here. Uh, we've seen a lot of young people go through the program who want to make a difference in the world. Uh, they want people to know God. They want them to be prepared for his return. And when they come through the three-month intensive programs here, they get skills that are going to make them ready to be able to be helpful in missionary projects that are going on around the world. And in fact, they um, make a commitment to spend six months at a project like that when they leave here. So let's show the audience a little bit of what students do here at MOVE. Okay, we're going to do that right now. Life presents me with many options. I could be doing so many different things, seemingly exciting things. But I have chosen a life of service. And this is truly exciting. Not because of what I do, but because of what Christ does in me. And what he does for others through me. This is the life that I have chosen, and I have no regrets. When I think to change the world, I think how much God must change me. I have not chosen the easy road, but I have chosen an incredible dream. I have chosen a life of purpose and satisfaction, with results that are eternal. A life of varied emotions, but a steadfast peace. The future is uncertain, but working for and with Jesus is all the certainty I need. I have decided to be a missionary and let God be in control of my life.
enjoyed that video, and we hope you are inspired to be a missionary someplace around the world, or even right where you're at. Good evening. I would like to thank Carla for this beautiful message that she shared with us. And I would like to finish the evening with a prayer. I invite you all to bow your head and pray with me. Dear Father, thank you for this beautiful day, for this beautiful evening. And because we have been able to come together, worship you, and be in community. Lord, we ask for your blessing now that we are finishing this evening and for you to be with us as we continue this alumni weekend. Be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a nice evening.